Hey, welcome to the Trap Little Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Today's guest is the co-founder and CEO of the music streaming service, AudioMac, Dave Mackley. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here. Glad, glad you uh, picked me to be on the, the show and on the newsletter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I think you were the first alum from Quinnipiac, which is also where I went to school. And for those listening, that is Quinnipiac. Everyone's been butchering the name and all these polls and everything going on recently. But yes, it's Quinnipiac University. Yeah, yeah. Quinnipiac's the, uh, known for its polls, which uh, this year were uh, pretty wrong. But um, <laughs> we'll see if they could uh, turn that one around next, next uh, in four years from now. We'll see. Right. Um, the- but, you know, if, if I tell people I went to Quinnipiac, they're like, I don't know what that is. Uh, is that a school? And then I'm like, yeah, it's a school. They do those polls. Like you see it, it has, a, it starts with the letter Q and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that I get it now. <laughs> that is the same exact line I go to because no one, the people that I don't know, it's like, oh, the polls. And of course oh. this year, more it's relevant. It's a school? <laughs> you know, like that's what you get. Oh, I didn't know it was a school. Yes, it, it is actually a school. <laughs> But no, today we're here to talk about the dope work and the good work that you've been doing at AudioMac. And it's a interesting time, especially because you had launched AudioMac in 2012, which was right around the time that so much was changing in streaming and digital music and more broadly in the industry. What was yeah. that like? like? Take us through those steps. What was it like? launching a company as you're trying to grow but also this landscape is changing dramatically yeah i mean we point to 2012 as like our launch date um it really didn't it was really just an idea at that point i think we incorporated we you know created a new york llc at that point but it didn't really launch into, until 2013 and you know it, it it started out as myself and friends of mine and business contacts just getting together colleagues and saying, we have this idea, um, we think it'd be cool. You know, we all have full-time jobs, but let's build this on the side and see what we could do with it. And, um, you know, I, I come from an online advertising background. I, I worked at DoubleClick. I met my co-founder, Dave Pony at, at Operative, another online advertising company. Um, and, you know, we figured what we could do was we could create a platform that was, was ad supported and didn't charge artists for services, right? because there was a lot of platforms at the time, um, which I, I don't need to name, I'm sure you know who they are, you know, that were charging artists for storage, for advanced features, for advanced st- statistics. And we just said, you know, this doesn't make sense. Like, you know, look at, what, look at the success of YouTube where they give everything to their creators for free. And, you know, all they ask in return is bring your audience here, bring your audience to YouTube, right? And if you bring your audience to YouTube, then YouTube wins and, the creator wins, right? So we figured we could do something very similar to that. We figured there was a, you know, there was a limit to what you could get out of charging creators. And someone could always come along and say, we're creator first, we're not gonna charge creators and we only win if you win. Um, so we, in order to do that, we had to support it through advertising. And that, that happened to be something that, you know, my co-founders and I were, were, were good at. So we built it and, uh, you know, it was a crazy time for streaming. Uh, it just went it just went much faster than we expected right so year one was let's build this thing let's try to get some users on it which is not easy you know you're faced with this situation where you have no fans and you have no artists so how do you get both at the same time because artists are not going to want to be on a platform without fans and fans are not going to be on a want to be on a platform without artists um but fortunately i'm also the founder of of dj booth so we we started circulating audio mac amongst among the, the artists that we, we worked with and, and the fans that we had. So we, we, we were kind of able to get both, right? To come at the same time. And then, you know, we got some early releases from J. Cole and, and Chance the Rapper that really helped us out. Um, you know, we're happy that they decided to release music with AudioMac and it just started growing. So, you know, year two was like convincing everybody to quit their jobs and work on it full time, uh, which wasn't easy, but, you know, in the end we all decided to do that and, you know, take, take pay cuts and, Put money back into the business but it, it was certainly a crazy time i i think a few things stuck out the aspect of 
let's pay and gather people's attention and then charge for advertising. That's essentially the backbone of all the social networks that we have today. And I can only think about how much more restricted they would have been if they had started charging back when everyone was like, okay, how is this Facebook thing going to monetize? So I feel yeah. like that was right there. But I think the DJ booth connection was strong. And yeah, for those that know, I know you mentioned it, but you are the co-founder as well of DJ Booth, which is one of the more respected publications focusing primarily on hip hop, but also talk about other aspects of music and where producers and DJs intersect. How important was that connection to what you were doing? I think it was really important because you have that chicken or the egg scenario, right? You need to, you need to get that spark moving on both sides of the, of the, of the marketplace. If you just have one side, they're going to churn. And we, we've seen that with other businesses that will get a bunch of money and say like, oh, we have Justin Bieber on the platform. And it's like, that's great, but you're paying him to do that. And he's probably not going to be there in a few weeks if he doesn't see, you know, interaction with, with his content, right? So you need that, you need both sides at the same time. And DJ Booth was able to help us do that. You know, we also built out a, a music player for blogs. And at the time, a lot of music consumption was happening on blogs and a lot of music discovery was happening on blogs. So that was our way of getting, um, you know, getting more artists to know about Audiomatic, but also more fans at the same time. So by giving the blogs a customized player that they could use, um, you know, and say, submit your music via Audiomatic, uh, that was a way to get both sides at the same time. And, and, and I think it would be difficult for someone to do that today because music consumption has music, music discovery has moved from the blogs in, in many respects to to the platforms. So it's it, it would be extremely hard to replicate that um, in in 2020 or 2021. I think it, it might actually be impossible. You know, especially I'd say it's definitely impossible if you don't if you started out the way Audiomack did, where we had you know five thousand dollars in investment from the founders and and sweat equity, and that was it. Um, so. I don't think it can be replicated now, but at the time in 2013, you could do that. You know, you could start to move discovery over to, to a platform like Audiomack, right? Right, that was the tail end of the blog era. And I feel like that worked pretty well in your favor and not that blogs don't necessarily matter in the same way they do, but the discovery aspect of people, especially a group of hyper-focused people being like, okay, where do I find the new music? that period from the mid 2000s up until, you know, 2012, 2013 was the perfect time for something like that. Yeah, it, it, you had a lot of blogs that were posting 10, 20 songs a day. And our, our initial goal was to get them to post those songs using Audiomack. And that, right. was, that was a big spark for us. Um, but I think that would be much, much more difficult to do today. Right. And you had mentioned J. Cole and Chance the Rapper. How did you convince them? What was the pitch? I think uh, our DJ booth connections helped there. Um, we had good relationships with them. Uh, you know, at the time, Chance the Rapper wasn't really very well known. You know, he had he had the 10 Days mixtape, you know, and then he released Acid Rap on, on Audiomack. Um, so I think the connection there, you know, artists like getting written about, certainly. So that, that's something that we would we would dangle in front of them, you know, features on, on DJ booth. We don't really know how J. Cole did, I mean, Jake. J. Cole released Truly Yours 2 on Audiomack. I think that was a big one. It, it crashed our servers for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes before we could get our CTO to leave dinner and, and fix it. Um, that was like one of the only times we've really been down, truly down for like an extended period, fully down. Um, I'm not sure, you know, it, it, I, think, I think someone in his camp, you know, saw Audiomack as a, you know, interesting platform for them to use to release the tape. Um, and also people wanted to get to the top of the charts. Like one of the, the, the things that we, we promoted the most in the early Audio Mac days was our chart, right? So, you know, if you got to the top of the chart, you would get a bunch of new fans because they were checking out the chart, right, every day. So it was a bit, you know, we looked to Hype Machine as, as the inspiration there. I, I, I like what, I've always loved what they did there. And we tried to create some of that. So, you, you know, artists would want to promote their music and get to the top of the chart. Um, we actually had Jennifer Lopez release her booty remix on Audiomack and I spoke to her manager and, and I was like, oh, how'd she hear about us? And she was just like, and he said, she wants, she wants to be at the top of your chart. You know, she, and, and, and 
She's like, it's a chart. He, he said it was a chart she hadn't been at the top of yet. And I was like, all right, that's great. Please release it. That, that, that's awesome. Um, so the chart was, um, was something that I think a lot of artists just wanted to get to see themselves at the top, right? And the idea was like, when we were smaller, even if you were a smaller artist, you could get to the top of that chart, you know, with some, some leg work. And that was, that was the way we built, built the platform because if we could give artists, if we could incentivize artists to promote Audiomack and bring their fans to us and give them reasons to do that, then we knew our, our strength only gets bigger, um, you know, as we get more fans and as those fans are, are gonna listen to the other music on Audiomack. And that helps all the, all the artists that decide to release music on Audiomack. Right. And especially at that time period, too, the streaming service was far, the streaming industry, rather, the sector was far less mature than it is now. And the big players now were not necessarily the ones back then. So there was a bit more fragmentation in a way where a new entrant that has a chart is going to stick out a lot more than I think maybe things may be today where people feel like they have a clearer idea of, okay, these are the ones that at least are the mainstream options, but some of these are a bit, um, you know, more specific for artist centric or non traditional major label type music and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I think what you're seeing now is that there's so much consumption happening on streaming platforms that it, it's difficult for a young artist to, to get noticed. It, it, it's, it's extremely hard. Right. And, I think we're solving this in two ways. You know, number one is we look at the trending section, right? Which is always updated. And we always try to give young artists that might have not gotten any placement anywhere else, some love on that, you know, some visibility on that, on that section, if their music's great. And, and all we need to see is some engagement that, that bubbles it up to our systems. And then from there, we can, we can allow it to be on the, on the trending section, right? Um, and then we break that down by genre and we try to get pretty specific in some of the genres we have so that we're trying to give as many artists the ability to get um, to gain new fans. The other thing that we're doing is we're looking, we're going to be launching regional charts uh, pretty soon. So you might, you might not be in the top 100 in all of the United States, but you might actually be in the top 100 in Texas, for example, or, or California. Um, so we're going to be launching a, a chart that actually breaks down, not just by country, it's gonna do country as well, but within uh, larger countries like the United States is actually gonna break it down regionally uh, by state. Um, and we're gonna to continue to work on that. And we have plans to maybe even get down to a city level in the next couple of years. But you know, the idea being, you know, there's definitely consumers that wanna know what's hot in their area, you know, what's hot in their city. And we're going to give them the ability to discover great new sounds that they might not have ever, ever heard before. So between those two things, we're trying to get as many people, as many artists as possible, uh, you know, new ways to find fans. And I think that's, that's, that's important because, you know, all the people that founded Audiomack, all the people that we hire are people who love that feeling you get when you discover new music, right? And it, you don't get that feeling when you hear a new song and everyone's listening to it. You, you're probably not going to get that feeling. You get, you get a better feeling when it's something new that you could go tell your friends about. And, uh, you know, you, you, get, you, get, you get that same tingle when you hear something and then it becomes something bigger, right, later on. You want to be the first to, to know about that. So I was, I was that person. You know, my co-founders are those people as well. We always wanted to be the ones handing out mixtapes and you know, this is before you could have digital playlists, actual physical mixtapes mix to people. Um, and we want to keep that, that spirit on Audiomack. So, you know, we want you to get that, those, those goosebumps in your arm when you hear something brand new and you think like, this person might be my new favorite artist. I have to go see this person live. I have to, you know, buy their t-shirts. I have to, I have to uh, you know, check out everything they've ever done. We want to create that experience as many times as possible across the Audiomack platform. Right. You're very much looking for that trendsetter friend, the one that wants to be up on things and then wants to tell their friends about it. And I guess from a customer acquisition perspective, like how do you go about trying to find that type of subscriber or that type of customer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we rely on the artists to help us there. So I like to say, you know, we have a small marketing team here. It's about 10 people, but 
our true marketing team is, is you know, 500,000 artists that have shared music on Audiomack, right? We want them to go out. And if you're a young artist, you are, you know, you can, you can send out a Spotify link, you can send out an Apple Music link, but, you know, not everyone's going to be able to listen to it. Not everyone has a subscription yet. And I think that's changing. But there's always going to, you know, if you, if you jump into a group chat and you were to send a link to a, a major DSP, chances are a good percentage of the people there can't listen to it, right? Um, you know, so if you want your music to be the most shareable and have, you know, which, which young artists want, you know, they want to get a, a major fan base first. Um, you know, that's step one, right? Uh, you can use a platform like Audiomack and you can know that everybody can listen. And everyone who listens can then go and share. And I think that makes it more, more viral. Um, you know, the number one music streaming service in, in the world is still YouTube. And it's not because it's a great music service. It, it, it's, it's definitely catered towards video, but it's more like it's easily accessible, right? It's accessible to everybody. Um, so what we've done is we, we've made sure that, you know, shareability is number one. We want users to come in and subscribe. And, you know, that's, that's a great way to support their, the artists they listen to more and put more money in their pockets. So, you know, if people do come in and listen, we're going to give them paths to go and subscribe. Um, but if they don't, we're going we're gonna to monetize them through, through advertising. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is we want to make the artists feel like they're succeeding. You know, make the artists feel like the more they put into Audiomack, the more, the more they get out of it. So because of that, we do things like, you know, keeping you aware of certain milestones that you've, you've reached on the platform and sending you emails with those milestones. It could be adding, getting added to a playlist that, that's really popular. It could be hitting you know, 100,000 plays or even 1,000 plays. Um, and then we encourage those artists to go out there and share it with their fan base. So their fan base becomes more aware of Audiomack. Because even if, even if their fan base, a high percentage of them do listen to music on, you know, they, they pay for a, a streaming platform, um, you know, a different streaming platform, they could still discover music on Audiomack. It's not an e either or situation. So we're really trying to play, create a platform that, that's music for everybody. Anybody can come in, anybody can listen. And if you're a young artist, we're gonna give you all those tools so you can find as many fans as possible. One of the other interesting things too about how artist centric the service is, there was changes at least in a few years, some of your more I guess competitors may be a strong word, but some of the other companies that are operating in the same space as you had changed their business model to start charging customers. And it created a pretty big, um, a pretty big response from communities that were upset that these platforms were now charging them. And I remember Audio Mac was one of the first to say, hey, here we are you can come to us. Like We're not going to have the same type of perspective that you all did. And I guess I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think you all were able to make work from the advertising perspective and not charging that you feel like some of your other competitors were forced to start charging instead? Yeah, I look at it on, on two sides. On the artist side, we're, we're not going to charge artists. Like we, we've made that we've made that call. We made that call very early. And I think it's, it's part of our compass, you know, the, the compass that we use to direct this business that we're going to try to be the advocate of the artist. The artist is not our customer. The artist is our partner. Right. And if the artist wins, uh, then we win and we make money as well. Right. They make money and we make money. So whenever we come up with a new feature, there's always the thought like, wow, this is really cool. We, we have these new advanced statistics. Should we put this behind a paywall? For the artist and the answer always is is no like we're not going to do that um if the artist uses this tool to understand their fan base more direct their marketing and we end up winning anyway because they bring more users to audiomack and the more fans we get the more artists want to be on audiomack so it, it, it's it, it it's a virtuous cycle um on the other side on the consumer side we're always going to have an ad supported side and you know i think that's that that cast the widest funnel and that's important for our user base because it's important for every artist across the world that they have a way to share music with everybody right you know it's especially important in emerging markets where you don't see a lot of music streaming penetration or paid music streaming penetration i think over time you know we do have a premium service it is it is a mid-market service it's not priced at the same price as, as spotify or apple music it's half the price um, 
And we're trying as much as possible to direct as many fans as possible to that service because it's in the best interest of us. It's in the best interest of, this, of, of the artists as well. You know, artists are going to get paid more the more um, subscribers we have, right? But we're never going to take away that other side because it's, it's an important part of our funnel. And like I said earlier, even if you are a music streaming subscriber somewhere else, you can still use Audiomack to discover new music. Maybe you're not ready to pay for two streaming services, which we do see some of our users doing. Um, but even if you're not, you can still use Audiomack as a, as a way for you to discuss music with fans, to, with, with friends, as a way to connect with artists, as a way to connect with music that you, you might not find elsewhere because the artist is directing you to that platform. Um, to, to Audio Mac to listen. Yeah, I think that charging customers has clearly worked a lot better in this industry than charging artists too. And I guess the flip side of charging artists is other services as well have started to segment more for the artists that are generating much more, whether it's in terms of revenue or bringing customers to them. And I know it can be very tempting for uh, streaming services to either focus more on the customers that are really serving them versus the ones that, you know, are doing fine, but they're just not as lucrative for the business as the ones that are really bringing it in. How do you go about segmenting the two of those, if at all, and how best to prioritize the services and the support given? Yeah, it's difficult. We, we have major label partners. You know, we work with distributors uh, across, across the industry. Um, we're working with you know smaller labels as well, independent labels. Um, the way we look at it is like we're trying to create a platform where everyone's on evil, even footing, and we're not anti-label. You know, a lot of artists need that. You know, being anti-label is kind of like being a business and being anti-VC, like venture capitalists. You know, like you can't just be like I'm a business and you know venture capitalists have no place in this. No, venture capitalists are important. Like sometimes you have a great idea. And you need support, you need cash, you need, you need resources, right? Um, labels are unique in that they provide not just cash, they also provide a team, right? And, and if you're a creative, you, you know, might make the decision, I don't want to focus on the business side of this. I don't want to focus on, you know, marketing. I want to, I want to focus on great music. So, you know, a lot of artists that have started out on Audiomack have signed with, with, with um, you know, labels like Warner Music, Sony, Universal, or smaller labels for distributors like Empire. And that's fine. We, we, we have relationships with those businesses. And w one of the mistakes we didn't want to make was say, we're independent only. You know, we're, what we are trying to do is we're trying to create a platform where regardless of what your status is, if you are um, on the biggest label in the world, or if you just started out and you just recorded your first, first music, we're going to give you the same tools. And we're launching the ability for anybody to submit to our curation team. All they have to do is authenticate that they are who they say they are. Um, you know, so we, we, we require some sort of verification there. Um, and then they can, they can go ahead and submit to us. And we're gonna look at their submission the same way as we look at every other submission that comes through. Uh, and if, if the music's great, we're gonna try to find ways to put that music in front of a, a new audience. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of like, being uh, a major label focused or big art or artist focused. It, it's, about, it's about trying to create that experience for as many fans as possible, the, the experience of discovering something that you love, that you didn't know existed a day before. Right, and I think especially today that major label versus indie discussion can be so polarized in a way where we're losing the nuance that actually is there and it's one of these things that it started off as more of like a, you know, intriguing question. Okay, what if, but now it's like, okay, it's, it's almost a reversion back to be like, no, there's still plenty of services and offering and considerations that people may not realize about why an artist may want to make the decision one way or another, which further makes it important for a company like yours to be um, flexible and not necessarily take a stance in that way. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And, and we're launching more services to get the labels and distributors some data on, you know, who they should be looking at. Because if, if, our, if, our, if our compass points us towards if the artist succeeds, we succeed, then what we can do for the artist is we can show them options, right? 
these are the, all the options you have. You can go with a small label, you know, that's gonna, and, and here are the advantages there. You can go to a distributor. You can go with, you know, someone like TuneCore that, that, that is a bit more hands-off, but then also has other services that are a bit more hands-on. And, and, and these are the differences between the two. Um, you could go to a major label and, and, and this, these are the advantages. But the artist is gonna win if they are able to get more offers, right? And they see all the different offers that are, are out on the table. Um, we're not in the interest of being a label or a distributor. We don't want to put our hands in the artist's pocket because we're, we're a tech company. We're a streaming company. You know, we win when we get more fans and more artists sharing on the platform. Um, so we're happy to send artists that we think are doing well. And, you know, the data on the platform shows that they're, they're, they're starting to grow their careers that they're getting great engagement, we're happy to send that data, uh, you know, to to labels and distributors, uh, who would then hopefully sign that artist and do right by by him or her. Or her. I want to talk a little bit more about DJ Booth, and I know that recently you all had an announcement where DJ Booth. Of course, there's always been a connection there, given your uh, experience there, but. Now, DJ Booth is now under the Audio Mac umbrella as Audio Mac World as part of the blog there. Can you talk a little bit more about the decision to bring them together? Yeah, they're, they're still separate businesses, but the partnership is an exclusive partnership for the DJ Booth content to be available on the Audio Mac app. And, um, you know, when I discover a new artist and I don't just want to listen to their music. I want to understand the artist, right? I want to know, I want to know more about them, where they're from. You know, I, I want to know the story, right? And and DJ Booth has that story. Um, so, what we've done is we're building a system where, you know, the content from DJ Booth is going to be available within the Audio Mac app. So when you discover that artist, you can go a bit deeper and you can kind of get that behind the scenes look at what they're doing. Um, you know, the companies are still separate, but it is an exclusive partnership. So you're not going to find that DJ Booth content pretty much anywhere else besides DJ Booth and, and Audio Mac. And I, I think that's the future of, of music streaming. So like if I were to look at where music streaming is going, I think Streaming 1.0 is, is really like, you know, it, it's this store. It, it, it has all the music in the world and it's just kind of putting playlists in front of you. Um, I think streaming 2.0 is going to look more like Audio Mac where it's the artist connecting with fans through the platform. And then I think bolted onto that, you're also taking on the editorial side as well. Because if, you're, if this is the place where you consume and listen to music, it's probably also going to be the place where you 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 listen you read about those artists you consume video about those artists. So I think our goal is to find partners like DJ Booth, and there could be other partners out there that are creating great content that we could bring into the Audio Mac world, and that's why we named it Audio Mac World. It's not just the music; it's the world around the music, right? Um, and then also making it global was was some of the the thought behind making it Audio Mac World because. You know, there's such great music coming out of Africa, Jamaica. We're seeing, you know, wonderful music coming out of Latin America. And, you know, just because you live in the United States doesn't mean you can't enjoy that. So uh, we wanted to create a, a really global experience. And, and one thing I've seen on other platforms is that you get stuck in this like echo chamber of, of music and uh, we want to avoid that. So, you know, these are the artists you should be checking out if you want to really get into, you know, Latin music or jazz or African music or you know, pretty much anything new that's going to come out. Uh, it's not just about listening to that playlist. It's about understanding, like, what is this? You know, why does it exist? Where did it start? Who are the artists that are making waves in it? Um, that's the type of stuff that excites me. And, and it's the type of stuff that I think it excites a lot of young people who really care about music more than the average person that's just going to sit back and, and listen to a, a radio station. Right. And I also imagine that the data that can come from having DJ Booth more directly connected, who's clicking on what articles, how many views are they getting, any comments, things like that. Those could then be further insights on who then you all could try to seek out partnerships with or where things are trending. I would imagine that's also a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. We look at a lot of different signals to um, determine what is doing particularly well 
uh, on the platform? You know, what, what, are, what are the diamonds in the rough? Uh, what are the things that are rising? And, you know, we look at an engagement score, how many people listen to it, skips versus shares versus favorites. Like there's certain activities, but then also if people are digging deeper and they're looking at that artist and they want to know more about that, that, that him or her, that means that it might not just be a great song. It might be, you know, it might be a superstar artist that people care about because you don't just listen to your favorite artists because the music's good. You also care about their entire personality and, and who they are. And I think that's something that is missing from a lot, a lot of streaming services. You don't get that. And AudioMax is a platform where, you know, we like to say the artist is uploading the music. The artist is going to respond to comments. The artist, you know, in the future is going to be able to, you know, uh, maybe DM their fans, for example. Um, going a step further and, you know, and had doing an interview with that artist is just another way for fans to connect. Um, so I see AudioMac becoming a bit like a, a hybrid between a streaming platform, a social network, and, and a bit of an editorial site as well. You know, these are all, the, all, these are all very critical to music consumption. You know, you want to connect not just with fans, but with other, uh, with other, with artists, you want to listen to music and you want to consume video and, and written content about, about the things you're listening to. Right. And that take is so tied in and relatable with what's happening elsewhere in the industry too. Streaming services are acquiring media companies. Record labels are acquiring media companies, many of them for the same reasons that you mentioned. And I really think that puts Audio Mac not just in a strong position itself, but also could be very much of interest to one of these other competitors that is, or not competitors, one of these other companies that wants the insights and wants the rich data that you all have, whether that's through a deeper partnership or through an acquisition. I'm sure you're probably getting plenty of people in your direction wanting to have those kind of conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Um... It's, it's, uh, it's always something we want to look into and, you know, we're, we're, we're always interested in, in having those discussions. Um, you know, we love what we're doing. We want to keep doing it. That's, that's what's most important to me. And, um, you know, we, we, we get a good feeling here when, when we feel like we help, we help, an, we help an artist gain new fans, you know, grow as an artist. Um, it, it's enjoyable, you know, so I, I feel pretty blessed. I think a lot of the people here, here feel blessed that they're able to do that every day. And, um, you know, working in the music space is, is, is just, it, it's, it's always been a dream of mine. It's always been, a, it's been a dream of a lot of the people who work here, I, I think. And um, we want to continue doing that, whether it's independently or, you know, potentially as part of a larger organization. But, you know, I'll tell you, I, I, I think we're, we're well positioned because I do think that the music, the streaming space is going to move more towards being a bit more social and being a bit more about connecting fans and artists. And, and that's where you can start to open up other revenue streams for artists, whether it be, you know, merchandising, touring, I mean, uh, you know, digital experiences, live experiences, like all these things can be done. But the linchpin of it, they, they, all these things can be done through other services, but the linchpin of it is where do you discover artists, right? Because you don't want to discover artists on one platform and then have to open up another app and search for them. It all needs to be done together. So when I hear someone tell me, you know, oh, I love AudioMac, I discovered A, B, and C on AudioMac, like that makes me really happy about the position that we have because as we start to open up more of these services, that means that person is going to just not just discover that artist on AudioMac, they're going to interact with him or her. They're going to maybe purchase things from him or her. They're going to get unique experiences from, from that artist. And that's where we're trying to head. And I think it's much more difficult for other platforms that are built more like a store, more like a tower records. Um, you know, I try to think of AudioMac as like a more scalable version of your local record shop where the artist might actually be there signing CDs or, or you know, signing records, right? And I feel like that, that's definitely the vibe I've gotten on the, on the platform too. It's Good. a place that 
you would expect to be able to have that fan interaction and the, the artist fan connection too. I mean, so many of the other digital student providers intentionally don't want the fans and artists to connect. And I think some of the pushback, at least I've heard from some extent, is that the minute that you create the opportunity for them to connect, there's the fear that they can then go off platform to have that connection. But what you all are saying is that if you create enough interaction and opportunity within the platform, then there won't be a need for them to go off the platform to begin with. No, I think that's a good assessment. And I think companies right now are making mistakes uh, by doing that because you'll always leave yourself open. You know, it's like, you know, you're making an aggressive, you know, chess move to try to get control, but like you're leaving, you're leaving the, the back file open for, for, you know, major destruction in the future. Right. So, um, I think that's that's short sighted. Like you think it's a power move. You think that you know by giving fans, you know, on some platforms, if you follow an artist, you're not really following them, right? And we saw that on Facebook too. You're not actually really follow. You know, you like a page, but then the artist or the creator of that page can't even reach you. I think that's the wrong move. I, I can understand why companies would want to do that because it puts more of the power in their hands. But you know, what have we seen? What's the lesson of like the last twenty years? The lesson is if you if you if you give people a platform where they have the power, it, it eventually succeeds, right? Like you know, I think you see that on on platforms like Instagram, you know, where they're not successful because it's the best audio sharing app, you know, uh, picture sharing app. They're successful because they empowered hundreds, if not millions, of creators to go out there and create their own businesses and create create things for themselves within the platform. And that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, you follow a, an artist on Audiomack, it's going to show up in your feed. We're not going to suppress that. You've made that decision. You know, the artist has sent fans to the platform to get followers. And we're not going to say, well, you know, maybe we'll show it. Let's let our algorithm decide that. That's not what we're going to do. Um, you know, not only are you, are you going to get that, not only is it going to show up in the feed, but it's also, we're also going to give that fan a push notification if they've if they've enabled push notification we're not going to suppress that it's not our decision the, the the fan decided to follow that artist the artist decided to bring his or her fans to audio mac so we want to make that connection and i think if you make that connection right and you build all these things into the platform you know you do give up some control but in the end you end up winning and you end up being in a much stronger position um, so i think i think it's a it's a mistake for other platforms to make that call. I think in the end, you know, democracy wins, you know, and, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're focused on. We talked a little bit about the future of streaming, both the future of audio Mac as well. Uh, you mentioned a number of things that I think make a lot of sense. I'm wondering what's your take on user generated content, because I see so much of that wave happening in video, of course, with the rise of TikTok and everything happening there. And I've been thinking about this myself. What does this look like from the audio perspective and how music then becomes the play there and who those entrants could potentially be if there is one? Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Audi Audiomax powered by UGC content. You know, we see uh, tens of thousands of artists upload their first recording ever, you know, on Audiomack. And I think we try to be step one for artists. You know, before you become a, a you know, a megastar, you know, you're probably releasing something that you don't even think is finished, but you, you don't want to, you know, there's always the story of like Billie Eilish who record, you know, her first big record was something she uploaded for a dance, for a dance she was doing, right? You know, for, for a dance teacher, but people ended up liking it. So, and, and then, you know, look at the trajectory she went on, right? So it's, there's always gonna be a new artist coming up. There's always gonna be someone who decides to record their first music. It's not our place to say like, well, you know, you didn't pay us money or, you know, you didn't get a distributor. So like, we're not gonna allow that on the platform. Our, our, our feeling is like, go do it, you know, like share it, get as many people to listen to it. You know, we don't care if it's just you and your, your mom and your friend, like that's fine. Like Audimax for that. Um, what we want to do is we want to find things that are starting to bubble up and have just incredible engagement because no one really knows what, what a hit's going to be. Um, 
And that's what we're focused on finding, like give everyone the platform, regardless of if they have money, give them all the tools, give them all, you know, give them unlimited uploads, unlimited stats, every single feature so that they could try to be successful. And if they are successful, then we win. You know, so UGC is, is important. Um, you know, as you get into remixes and things like that, or, um, you know, different alterations you make to other people's content, that's something we have to be careful about. You know, we have to be respectful of rights holders because they might not want that content available. Um, some of them might want to monetize it. And some of them might want to say, you know, we've had labels say, go for it. We're, we're into it. Let people remix. Um, other people not, might not be as forthcoming. But I think over time, uh, there is the methods to get the people who created the original work and paid out for their work, but then maybe even also pay out the people who created derivative works for it. I think those, those, um, those methods are gonna start to come into, into focus. And I think Audiomack is positioned the best to take advantage of that. And if we could do it well, then everyone wins, right? You know, you, you, there have been many remixes that have gone more viral than the original. We've seen that, you know? And if you, the same thing I said about democratization, like you're sort of saying, here's my work, I'm cool with everybody altering it. Let's try to make a hit together. And we all win if we do, right? So, but I, I, we always go back to the artist, right? It's up to the artist to decide if that's the right path for them. And if, if it's not, and, it, and if it's something they don't want to do, then it's our job to try to protect their work because they've, they've, they've added it to Audiomack and perhaps they don't want those types of alterations on the platform. It's definitely not an easy, easy, easy issue. I think we're trying to solve some of the issues that other people in this industry face and that they've got a lot of flack for not handling well. Um, and I think we've done a good job of it. Right. Yeah, I think that the way that memes are used or rather any other clips, a lot of the things that are trending well on social media, I think that the people that aren't in the industry and close to it realize that, yeah, there's a lot of licensing issues. People may not want their content and it's rightfully theirs to be able to make that call or not. I see that on the other side you also see the wave of opportunity and interest there. So if there's a way that these things can link up in a way where the artists or slash the record labels, ones who actually own the content are game. And I mean, I think we've seen a, a bit of that with some of the apps that have risen in the past couple of years, but we'll see. I think there's still a lot of things to figure out from that perspective. We'll see. I, I think I'd be very surprised if three, four years from now, there weren't a, 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 a number of artists who were saying, please remix my, my work and, you know, let's, let's share in the success together. Um, there'll always be ones that don't want to do that. And, and, but I think there will be a robust market for it. And I think the platforms like Audio Mac are, are the ones that are best uh, positioned to take advantage of that. Right. So we're getting to the tail end now, uh, but before we let you go, Dave, is there anything else that you want to plug or let the Trapital audience know about? <laughs> Um, well, you know, we, we are going to announce, uh, in the next, uh, couple of weeks that we're going to open up our AMP program, which is the audio Mac monetization program to every creator on the platform that hits a, a certain amount of plays, um, and authenticates that they are who they say they are. So, you know, the challenges we had to do, the challenges we had to get over in order to launch this were, you know, we want to make sure that artists are getting paid for their work, not someone else's work. So we had to build authentication systems to make sure that people are who they say they are. Um, you know, proper filtering. So if they're uploading something that they don't have the rights to, we can remove that. And then also payments, you know, being able to pay people uh, in, in, in every country around the world. So we're gonna be launching for US artists, uh, Canadian artists and artists in the UK in the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to be launching in Africa and Latin America shortly after as we um, refine some of the payment systems for, for those lo locations. Um, this is really important to me and it's a project we've been working on for the last two years uh, because it's important that every artist is able to come onto Audiomack and if they have success, they're able to share in, in that revenue. 
Um, it's not an easy thing to do because we're, we're going to probably quickly see, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of artists on this, uh, on the platform, you know, generating revenue. And we have to make sure that we're prepared for that. But, uh, you know, we, we, I think we've built a solid system that's going to, um, you know, scale, scale well and give, you know, every artist their chance to make their first dollar on, on, uh, from music streaming, you know, like the, the, the analogy I have here is, you know, I, I created my first website when I was 17 and, you know, put AdSense on it. Um, it was maybe 18, put AdSense on it. And, you know, I was super excited to see 40 cents come in, you know, a few days, a few days later. And then I was like, you know what, like maybe I could get this to a dollar a day. Um, and then I was like, maybe I could get this to like pay for lunch every day, you know, and, and then I kept going at it. And, you know, that's how you become, you know, someone who owns a company like Audiomack, it's like you, you, not everyone starts, you know, going 60 miles an hour, like you have to start somewhere. And for artists across the world, we want them to start with Audiomack. So uh, the, the AMP program, once it's launched, you know, is going to give every artist that opportunity. And we're, we're really excited to put it out there and, and see what response we get from artists. I like that. It's that mentality. Once you can make $1 on the internet, then you know you can make two, you know, you can make 10 and you just keep pushing that mentality forward. Well said. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it encourages, what we've seen is that the art, it's been in beta for the last year and a half, two years. Um, the artists that are in it, you know, they, they want to promote Audiomack because we've created a system where, you know, like early AdSense, you can see the revenue the next day. Like it's not, one of the things that bothers me about um, the music industry today is that it's, it's, it's not very transparent and it's very delayed, you know, so like artists don't really understand what's going on. And, and that, that I think is a disadvantage for other platforms where you're not, there's a disconnect between the activities you're doing to promote your music and the revenue you're making, or, or even your statistics. Like we've seen platforms where the statistics are delayed, but Audiomack, the statistics are real time. And we're trying as hard as we can within reason to make also the revenue as close to real time as possible, which is a bit more challenging because, you know, revenue comes from a lot of different places, especially advertising. Um, you know, and oftentimes you don't know that for, for days after. So we're trying to make estimates, give, give the artists an idea. Like if you do this, if you go out on social media and you promote Audiomack and you get fans to listen, you know, you're seeing not just more fans, you're seeing revenue. And then, you know, from there, we've, empower that artist to become a marketer for the platform. I think you figured it out in terms of how the artists can be the ones that are marketing the platform itself, but then making sure that understanding who the real customer is. Yeah. I feel like the, the flow is pretty, is, is, is well thought out. So great job on that. No, I think it's Thank good you. stuff. Yeah. Uh, don't congratulate me yet. We, we got to launch it first and you know, there's always, <laughs> and I'm it's, sure always that... a, it's always a critical time, but well, I think, We've done extensive testing, and I think it's it's going to be a big win for us. I'm I'm super excited about it. Um, you know, it, it's just wonderful to see artists start their careers and grow their careers on Audiomack, and then you know go on to much bigger bigger things. But but still stay with us because that's where their original fans are. That's where their day ones are. Right, right. So if anyone is listening and you haven't visited Audiomack yet, whether you are an artist or you are a fan that is looking for Discover New Music, you can go to audiomack.com. But if anyone wants to follow you and learn a bit more, um, any other, um, where can they follow what you're doing, Dave? Uh, I'm, I'm at Audiomackly on, on Twitter. Um, the, na the company is not named after me, uh, but someone suggested that it would be a good Twitter handle. Uh, my co-founder and I used to work at a company called Traffic Mac. So we were just oh, like, okay, that's where it comes from. It's just, we just, we're like, we're just not very original, but we like the name. So <laughs> we, we stuck with it. And then someone said, well, it's, it, you know, you should go by Audio Mackley. So Audio Mackley on Twitter. And then my Instagram just pictures of my kids. So don't, don't even bother. <laughs> nice. Nice. Good stuff. Dave, thanks again for doing this. This was fun. Uh, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you. Thanks again. Later, Dan.